Okay, welcome everybody. It is an absolute pleasure to welcome all of you to the second of our High Holiday Season classes, Why Is It So Hard to Let Go? And tonight's class actually has the title, Why Is It So Hard to Let Go? How do we stop ourselves from making the same mistakes over and over again? That was last week. And this week, I'd like to focus on one of the deepest parts of human psychology of why we find it is so hard to let go. And I want to start with a very important passage. I want to start with a section of the Torah that we will be reading um, this week. And the passage that we will be reading this week comes from Devarim chapter 30. This is, for context, the end of the Torah. This is the end of Moshe's life. And this is his final message. And what was Moshe's final message to the people that he loved? Moshe's final message was, you're going to mess up <laughs> and you're going to ruin it and it's all going to go wrong and it's going to be a disaster. However, however, there will come a time where you will be given an opportunity to fix what you ruined, to fix what you spoilt, and you'll have an opportunity to make it better. You'll have an opportunity once again to be able to return. This is the key word in the passage. You will be able to return. Now, I'm going to read this passage twice, okay? And the first time, I want you to tell me what you think this is referring to. And then we're going to read it a second time, and then we'll see if we can understand it. Do you all see the screen, by the way? Give me a thumbs up or a nod. Okay. Let's read it quickly in the English. And it will be, this is Devarim chapter 30, and it will be when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, that you will consider in your heart among all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. And you will return to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you will listen to his voice according to all that I am commanding you this day and your children. Then the Lord your God will bring back your exiles and he will have mercy on you. He will once again gather you from all the nations where the Lord your God has dispersed you. When you obey the Lord your God to observe his commandments and his statutes written in this Torah, and when you return to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Amazing. Now, I've just given you four lines here. This is chapter 30 of Devarim, and I've cut and pasted here verses 1, 2, and 3, and then verse 10. Do you see that? Verses 1, 2, and 3. And then verse 10, I've skipped verses four to nine, and I've just given you what is the crux of this passage. Now, this was a cursory reading, and I will ask you, please, what does it mean to return? That word return, we see it over here. Let me highlight it. And we see it over here. I'll highlight it again. You will return to the Lord your God. You will return to the Lord your God. What does return with a cursory glance mean to you? You can unmute yourself and just uh, chime right in. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, Philip. Welcome. <clears throat> so right away, these two sections are referring to two different kinds of return in my mind. One is a national return when the nation of Israel returns and the second one is a personal tshuva and um, I think that's one of the big differences and there are different roots of tshuva also the national return as a nation and then your personal return excellent <clears throat> excellent so the first thing that Philip is noticing is that perhaps and I'll leave it as a maybe for now perhaps these words return are actually referring to two different things. They're referring to two different things. One is the collective nation of Israel, and the second is a personal individual in, individual person who is making a return to God. 
Okay, but what are we returning from? But that that that's I'll call that level two. How you're splitting the two different returns? What is the return? Returning from what? Aura, what did you want to suggest? I just wanted to point out that in both returns, um, the word uh, Elohecha is in the singular. So I don't know whether it's one is collective and the other is individual because of the singular form. It's not Elohechem. Okay. So there seems to be that we're speaking towards an individual because each time it is your God singular. So whether it's the first section of return or whether it's the second section of return, we're speaking to private individuals here. A singular person, excellent observation or a good use of the Hebrew as well. But I'll ask my question again. It's not that there's anything wrong with Aura or Philip's approaches, but I want to start at the beginning. Where are we returning from? So it could be perhaps a return from exile, because we talk about banishment, and it could be a return from... Um... Precisely. Precisely. The first simplest sense here is that where were we <laughs> previously? Where were we previously? We were not at home. We were not at home. And actually the text, I'm highlighting it in purple. The text is absolutely categorical. And it will be when you are among the nations where God has banished you, you will return. And again, if you take a look over here in this part, he will again, once again, Gather you from all the nations. So I think that a simple reading here, and I'm going to leave Philip's comment open that the first return might not be the same as the second return. I will come back to that. But I think the simple sense here of return is that we were in exile. We lost our land. We were outside of our home. And the place where we are returning from is simply exile, a place where we are not supposed to be. And the return, therefore, is to the land of Israel. This, I would like to argue, is the straightforward read of the passage. And indeed, this is not my reading of this passage, but rather Nachmanides. Nachmanides, the Ramban, 14th century Spanish commentator, reads this passage in Devarim, and he says it's speaking about the nation of Israel returning back to its land at the end of days, a period of exile where God will banish the Jewish people throughout our history, and at the end of time, there will be a returning back once again to the land of Israel, where the Jewish nation will set up home again in our ancestral homeland. Could it be that just a mere 75 years ago, with the reestablishment of the state of Israel, this chapter 30 of Devarim is a prophecy that has come true in our lifetimes? That is an interesting question. However, David, you had a different possibility. You were going to suggest something else. A more complicated one that I'll have a harder time explaining would be the return from uh, perhaps where we were last week <laughs> in Go bad on. habits, uh, not, not, uh, not in a good place and returning towards God from a personal exile, from, from where our values or our beliefs would want us to be. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Return isn't a geographical position, but rather return is a spiritual opportunity. To return is to go back to how our behavior once was, pure, simple, unadulterated, innocent, correct. And in the course of our lives, 
we have fallen, we've stumbled, we have become a little complicated along the way. Says God, there will come a time after all of these things have happened that you'll return to the Lord your God. And how is it that you will return? You will return with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there was a comment? Yes, I, um, you know how obstinate I am. So I want to just develop now, according to what you said, this duality of ideas. The first return is the only one you're discussing so far. Is this, uh, to be a Jew is to be two different things. It's to have a relationship, a personal relationship with God, but it's also to be part of a history, part of a story. And our story has kept us actually uh, uh, alive and, uh, and uh, vibrant as a nation over all these years. This is part of our story. And this is where we fit in among the nations, where it is, where it could be among the, when we were uh, captives in Egypt or when our forefathers were, were uh, uh, in a difficult situation among the nations and throughout history, not only uh, Egypt, but going forward from there, the Babylonian exile and all those things are related to Israel as a people. Israel. So you want to read this now on a national level? Yes, it's the memory. It's it's it's. So it's, that's it's, fine. That's how we explained it earlier. It's the Ramban Nachmanides approach. Here is that this is referring to a national story of the jewish people returning back home that's absolutely that's i believe the simple reading of this philip and that's clear so uh i don't know if you need to introduce your comments by saying you know how obstinate i am you're simply corroborating what it is that we've already established at the beginning i think we're all in agreement so far probably so good doing, probably i'm starting to do a little bit of chuva so uh oh okay that's good very nice. I'm Very nice. Obstinate. What I want to do now <clears throat> is look at the Hebrew. Because you'll notice in verse 2 a very interesting uh, description of returning. And that returning says as follows. V'shavta ad Hashem alokecha. If I was to translate this into English, I would say, and you will return to the Lord your God. <laughs> it's very simple, actually. Veshavta ad Hashem alokecha. You will return to the Lord your God. Veshavta ad Hashem alokecha. Fine, straightforward. But take a look at the end of verse 10. And here we have a slightly different formulation in the Hebrew, and that is Kitashuv El Hashem Elokecha. Do you see that word there? Kitashuv El Hashem Elokecha. When it will be that you will return to the Lord your God. Now, if I'm translating it into English, I'm really stuck now because all I have is when you will return to the Lord your God. In both instances, you're returning to the Lord your God. But that's in English. Look carefully for a moment. Don't look at the English. You will return to the Lord your God. When you return to the Lord your God. They're the same. I've even bolded the words and underlined them in the English. However, take a look at the Hebrew. Because this is where it becomes fascinating. Veshavta ad. Hashem Elokecha. What word is used for the word to? You will return to God. Ad. And over here, what word is used when we return to? Kitashuv El. Hashem Elokecha. In the first instance, we're using the word Ad. In the second, we're using the word El. Is that clear? I just want to point out the change in language. Is that clear? When we say the word tashuv ad, tashuv el. 
Now, you might say to me, Rabbi Fishman, don't drive me crazy. What are you trying to do to me? Like, I'm not a Hebrew expert. And is this going to change my life? I don't think so. You pointed out how in one instance, we've got the word ad. Another instance, we've got the word el. But no, like, really, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, like, what, what's going on here? And in English, when you return to, and when you return to, but listen very carefully, because this is extremely important. In the Hebrew Bible, we believe, traditional thought believes, that every word is precious, every word is chosen ultimately by God. And therefore, if a different word is used, even as small as the word, when you return to, if it's a different word that is used in the Hebrew, then what is being alluded to is a slightly different nuance of meaning. By definition, it has to be that way. Otherwise, we would have simply used the same Hebrew word. But if we're using ad and then we're using el, then there's got to be something that's being hinted at of a slight subtle difference in the quality of the return now good news everybody about 200 years ago there lived a rabbi who was passionate about one thing and one thing only in his life do you know what he was passionate about hebrew grammar and linguistics and he set out to write one of the most greatest Torah commentaries that we have available to us and his entire Torah commentary was pointing out every single nuance where language was subtly different where one word in Hebrew was used instead of another even though they were basically synonyms for one another could you imagine writing such a commentary on the Torah this person was a genius of Hebrew language grammar etymology the subtleties and nuances contained within and he wrote an enormous body of text his name was the malbim malbim the malbim you can google him look him up on wikipedia and i'd like to share with you the commentary of the malbim when he did when he did what we just did he one day was sat at home who knows, maybe it was eight days before Rosh Hashanah, just like we're sitting at home eight days before. And he's looking at chapter Devarim 30. And he says, hang on a second. Vashavta ad Hashem? Kitashuv el Hashem. Why is it over here ad? And why is it over here el? Let's take a look at the Malbim. This is what he says. The Malbim's commentary. Take a look at the following. And you will return to the Lord your God. Shahurak ad Hashem alokecha. <laughs> he makes it so simple. Let me translate. Let me explain. My dear friends, do you know what the Malbin has just revealed to us? Something incredible. He says the difference between the words ad and el are that there is a repentance that can happen, a process of a person returning. And that process goes up to, but only so far. It doesn't reach the destination. Says the Malbim, the first time the word teshuva is used, vashav ta'ad, ad means you will only go so far in your journey of accomplishing your goal of returning and repenting to God. But you knew, will not reach the destination. That is the nuance in the word 
to. If we were to translate the word to in English to another English word, I would use the word towards. You will return towards. Let me give an example. Let's say we'll give a Hasidic story example. As you well know, Hasidic stories involve people getting lost in forests. It's just where the best Hasidic stories took place. And in this example, somebody gets lost in a forest. And then they realize as they've been walking and walking and walking, and each time they're walking, they're going further away from their destination. They realize, I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn around 180, and I'm going to go back the way I came. At that moment, when they stop and turn around, have they reached their ultimate destination? No. They're still in the middle of the forest. But they've begun to start to make a return towards home base. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. This is how we use the word towards in English. I haven't reached my destination, but I'm certainly going towards my destination. This, says the Malbim, is the word ad. However, in the end of time and in the end of history, in the end of days itself, the Jewish people will achieve what? Ki tashuv el Hashem elokecha. Do you know what el is? L is reaching that high lofty place of actually achieving one's goal, reaching the destination. And this, in a simple sleight of hand, almost by magic, is how the Malbim explains this grammatical nuance of difference between the words Ad and between the words L. Ad implies towards up to yet not having quite reached it l means to you've gone all the way you've found your destination you've reached your finish line now if we stopped our class there my fine feathered friends you would go home and someone would say, oh, how was the Torah class that you were eagerly anticipating? I always remember that Rabbi Fishman starts with a bombastic comment that it's going to change your life. Did he prove his worth? You would say it was the most boring class I ever attended. I don't know what he was doing today. He taught me some useless grammatical nuance of Hebrew language, ad and el. They both mean the word to in English. I could have spent my time twiddling my thumbs and it would have been a lot better. But friends, don't leave the class now. Because this was the necessary first introduction that will allow us to get to where we need to get to. Because it's at this point I want to introduce you to the gold that I have stored at the end of the rainbow. And what is that gold? The gold is another Torah commentator, not the Malbim of 200 years ago, but Rabbi Isaac, Abraham Isaac Yitzhak HaKohen Cook, Rav Cook, the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of pre-state Israel. And Rav Cook writes a tiny little pamphlet called Lights of Return, or what? Hatashuva, the lights of return. And in this tiny little pamphlet of only 20 odd small, tiny chapters, we stumble across chapter 17. Friends, I want to read you a passage of chapter 17. And if I can do this the right and proper way, You'll stick this on your fridge for the rest of your days, and your lives will never be the same. Should we give it a go? Let's try. Yesherotzim be'emet lashuv. 
when a person in truth wants to return. Let's stop there. Just three words. Everyone wants to be a wonderful person. If I said to you right now, when you woke up this morning, what was the first thought that you had? You would, you would have told me, I'm going to eat better today. I'm going to do my exercise today. I'm going to be the person that I want to be today. I'm not going to get angry at my colleague. I'm not going to snap at my partner. I'm going to have a great day and I'm going to be the person that I want to be. And I know I'm not always that person. And God help me, there are times when I fall and I stumble. But today, I want to be a great. If I asked all of you, you'd say the same answer. I want to be a great person today. But you know what that's called? That's just called wishful thinking. We all want to be better. But what happens when we're really serious about it? When we actually look in the mirror and we have that brutally honest conversation where we see the person staring back at us and we say, I want to take my life seriously. How long am I going to be acting the way I'm acting? I want to really take my life seriously. Stop hoping for my life to change. Stop the wishful thinking. Stop the magical thing. I'm actually going to take steps to make this better. Because I don't like the way I live. I know I can live better. Let's find an example. Let's make this practical. Let's think of a sin. Let's think of a terrible mistake that everyone here makes. I look out at you and what do I see? I see holy, righteous people. So the only the only thing I can imagine that anyone here would do that would be wrong, would you bite your fingernails. You bite your fingernails. That's the worst thing I can think of any of you. You're such righteous, holy individuals. You bite your fingernails. And what does Rav Cook say? Kishrotzim be'emet lashut. When a person really wants to repent. A person, yes, I want to stop biting my fingernails. That's it. No more biting my fingernails. Even though that person is held back because of many things that are stopping them. Even though that person is holding back because of the many things that are withholding them. Come on, Mahmoud Bulbudat. He just doesn't have clarity of mind. Just doesn't have clarity of mind. Or Mahmoud Khalishat Koach. Or maybe they're just weak. I want to stop biting my nails, but what can I do? I'm weak. I just can't do it. I just can't help myself. Or there's an inability to fix those things that are happening between him and his friend. I can't stop biting my friend's fingernails. Af al pi shaha ikuv hu gadol ma'od. Even though what is holding you back is enormous, Vahalev Muchrach Liot Nishba. And it's clear that the heart is broken. Mipne Yidiot Gadol Hachoba Hamutalek Al Haadam. Because the mind knows just how great is the obligation that is resting upon the person. That I can at Kol Pagmav to fix all of his misdeeds. It's heartbreaking. I can't stop these patterns of behavior. I just can't break these cycles. And I know I must. And I know the Torah demands it of me. And I know my friends are looking for me to change. And I know my spouse is constantly repeating the same refrain. Why are you still? And it's breaking my heart to realize how serious this is. And I just can't change 
מכל מקום, nevertheless. כיוון שהרצון לשוב בתשובה הוא אמיץ, because the desire to repent is so strong. Listen carefully to that line. Didn't say that you are returning and you are repenting. The desire to be better, just the desire is so strong. I want to be better. God only knows and God does know that I can't stop eating cake at 11 o'clock at night in front of the fridge. And I think no one's looking and I can get away with it. And I'm wondering why the scales don't go down when I'm killing myself with a protein shake for breakfast. But every night at 11 o'clock at night, I'm having a piece of cake quietly. But God knows the desire is there. I just want to change. I want to break out of this behavior pattern. Even though he has not the strength to overcome everything that's holding him back. One needs to honor this precious light of repentance that has started to shine upon the individual in all of its purity and in all of its holiness. What is he saying here in this last passage? He's saying you want to change. He's saying you're so desperate to change, but you're stuck. And you can't get over that hump. You can't get over your habits. You can't get over those patterns. You can't get over all of those instincts that are just screaming out the chocolate cake, eat me. When that person, even as they're putting the cake in their mouth, is like, oh, I don't want to be doing this. <laughs> that desire, that desire is something to honor. And that desire actually shines a light down from heaven that is holy and that is pure upon that person. You are not the same person, even though you're making mistakes, even though you're falling down, even though you're slipping, you're not the same person because you're a person that has the desire to want to change. You just feel that you can't. And yet that desire has a light from heaven emanate and shine down upon you that is holy and pure and it changes you. It changes you. And you know where we see this in the Torah, says Rav Kook? You're not going to believe it. He says we see this so clearly in the passage that we started with, Devarim chapter 30. <laughs> you know where we see this idea? In the two expressions of how the Torah refers to returning back to God. Let me ask you a question. Yes. Let me ask you a question. Rosh Hashanah comes. By the way, it's in eight days. Have you made your New Year's resolutions yet? Remember, New Year's resolutions are not for December 31st. But your New Year's resolution, whatever it is, you fill in the gap. Not going to smoke anymore. Not going to sneak a piece of chocolate cake at 11 o'clock at night anymore. Going to go to the Gaim. That's how you pronounce it, right? G-Y-M. Gaim, right? Never actually been to one of those. I think that's, I, I've heard, I've heard about them. <laughs> oh, Jim. Sorry, Jim. I'm going to get a gym membership. I always thought it was Gaim. I've never actually stepped inside one of those books. I'm going to go to the gym this year. Whatever, you fill in the blank. I'm going to stop gossiping this year. I'm going to stop being nosy. There. Whatever it is, whatever it is. And you say, this is the year it's going to happen. This is the year I'm going to do it. And like last week, as we saw, 
you take it so seriously, you know what your triggers are, you know what your habits are, and you know what your rewards are. Do you remember that reward loop mm -hmm. and the habit reward loop that we spoke about last week? Sylvie asked me to send you last week's uh, handout. I, I've got this unbelievable, now that will change your life as well. So you, you, you know what your triggers, your habits, your rewards are, and, and, you're, and you're like, you're changing your life around. And then what happens? Come Hanukkah. <laughs> Come Hanukkah time. So you start off well. Middle of September. I'm doing great. Hanukkah's early this year, by the way. Beginning of November. <laughs> Come beginning of November, you're already like, you're back on the chocolate cake. You've let your gym membership slip. You're smoking again. You're gossiping. You're doing whatever it is that you didn't want to be doing. So what do you tell yourself at this point? What do you say at this point? Did I succeed or did I fail? So most people will traditionally say, when everything's gone to pieces by Hanukkah time, I failed. I failed. And what does that lead to? It leads to the permission to stop trying. Mm -hmm. Because there is a deep psychology that as long as I'm beholden to my goals, I can slip up, but I'll still keep trying at it. Right? This is why diets include a cheat day. I know not everyone holds of this theory, but some diets include a cheat day as if to say, it doesn't matter that you had the pizza. It doesn't matter that you had the pit. Get back on the wagon the next day. It's okay. You, you had the whole pizza and the garlic bread and the chocolate molten lava cake. Okay, fine. But now tomorrow, get back on the wagon. Back to the gym, back to another run on the Peloton. You can do it. But that's why we've got a goal. That's why I'll and all the while that we're beholden to our aims. Once we tell ourselves all bets are off, then we give ourselves permission to no longer try. And this incredibly powerful insight into human psychology, Rav Cook wants to suggest, is alluded to in these two Hebrew words of returning back to God, Ad and El. You know what it means to return all the way back to God and succeed and L? That's everything. That's when you hit the jackpot. That's when you are weight ready for the beach. That's when you haven't smoked a packet of cigarettes in 20 years. That's when you no longer gossip. That's when you're no longer eating poor. That's what you've succeeded. That's success. You've achieved it. But Rav Cook says, don't for a second dare think that because you've fallen or you've failed, that all of the attempts and all of the effort and all of the desire that you had wasn't itself worthy, wasn't itself holy, because it absolutely was. And here we come to the greatest idea ever. We can fall even in our attempts to become better people. We can fail at our desperate tries to improve. And yet that doesn't mean that we give up altogether. Because it's a stumble along the way to our destination. And we never take ourselves out of the game. No matter the mistake, no matter the failure. We do not become our failures. And this now comes to the crux of what I want to share with you. And I believe it's embedded in Rob Cook's ideas. Modern humanity has taken a terrible poison of associating our inner selves with the mistakes that we make. And so a person who falls and fumbles and falters suddenly doesn't see their behavior as having been 
a mistake, but they see them they see themselves as being the failure. Instead of my actions today failed, it becomes I am a failure. And we internalize our mistakes, projecting that self of falling down onto our very essence. So when you get plus the pleasantries, hi, how are you doing? Great, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm great, thank you. And you come to a much deeper level of honesty. Not how are you doing, but who are you doing? Who are you? Tell me your essence. Tragically, modern man will say, I'm a failure. I see where I want to be, and I just see how I'm not there. And I'm just, I'm just I'm falling, and I'm slipping, and I'm failing, and I'm failed. And the great tragedy with coming to such a narrative is that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because we give ourselves permission to continue down a path of negative behavior now without anything holding us accountable. Well, now that I see myself as inherently a failure, now I'm allowed to act in such a manner. And Rob Cook says, a failure is never to be associated with the person themselves. Because we all stumble and we all fall and we all make mistakes. And in our core, we are pure. And in our core, we are holy. And that desire, that absolute ruts on, that will to want to be better, shines a light down upon us. So when you get to the beginning of December, and okay, you're not exercising. Okay, you're snacking. Okay, you're smoking it. Okay, you're gossiping it. Whatever it is. Don't think it was nothing for the last 10 weeks when you were trying from Rosh Hashanah to the beginning of December. That was an effort. And that effort changed who you were. And he goes on to find this idea contained in these words, Ad and El. When a person wants to return, when a person wants to repent, an internal psychological change is happening. No one will see it. No one will understand it. No one will be aware of it. It is a tshuva pnimit, an internal psychological revolution that's taking place. Rather, on the outside, it's just covered over with many interruptions, many things which are separating our true selves from how we truly wish to act internally. But the truth of the matter is, in koach b'shum ikuv uminiat hashlama la'akev et oh elion mohafia alinu, no impediment or lack of completion can ever keep that highest light from reaching us. We don't need to get to our goal. We don't need to reach the finish line. We need to try, and we need to have that desire internally. And when we do, a light shines upon us. And that's us returning towards God. We don't quite get there. We don't quite reach it. Because by definition, we're human and we never can and we never will. But when we have that desire, a light of holiness shines upon us and reminds us that we are holy too. I want you to think about this for the next 10 years of your life. Because this will change your life. Now, I want to take you out for ice cream. I know that's a horrible analogy after speaking about food as one of the things that we're trying to change. But I want to take you out for ice cream and I want to give you the cherry on the cake. I'm really mixing my metaphors today and they're all food. You can tell what's on my mind right now. You don't need a Freudian slip psychologist to tell you what I'm thinking of right now. But I want to take you out for ice cream. 
You want the cherry on the cake? Listen to this. Rav Cook. Rav Cook, as well as being the first chief rabbi of pre-state Israel, as well as being the leading halachic rabbi of his generation, as well as writing poetry on these concepts of repentance, he actually wrote poetry. In his spare time, I don't know when he had spare time, the man never slept. In his spare time, he wrote poetry. Can you imagine? And I want to finish with one of his poems. Because I think it speaks to all of us right here, right now. It's called To the Poet of Teshuva, Mishorer Hachuva. I'll read it out for you. I'll read his original and I'll translate. Mishorer Hachuva, O poet of Teshuva, Mishorer Hachuva, Hanoladta Kfar, are you born yet? Vim Bashakim Odena. And if you are yet still in the heavens, Surah Shama Nishmatcha. If there is bound your soul, Basura Hachayim in the bond of life, Meheira Rada. Come down from those heavens quickly. Vore Kinorech. And arouse your violin. Yishmu kol dak e lev. And all of depressed hearts shall hear. Yazinu kol arale ruach. And all of uncircumcised spirits shall listen to the sound of your harps. This is a stunning poem with multiple levels of meaning, interpretation. But most simply, there is this ultimate poet somewhere up in the sky, and we're not even sure if they are born yet. And if yet they do exist somewhere up above, come down. Quickly come down, we need you. We need that inspiration. We need that music. We need your violin. Please play that sweet music to arouse us, to change our hearts. Because our hearts are depressed and our souls are uncircumcised. And yet when we hear that music, we will know and we will listen and we will hear those harps that will be the song played by the poet of teshuva the poet of repentance this is heavy i'm not gonna deny it this is real if we are gonna be honest with ourselves for a minute this is the real deal what I wanted to share with you tonight is what is so challenging to me and to kind of share my heart a little bit and be vulnerable with you. There's a desire. Yeah, I want to eat better. I want to not gossip. I want to fill in the blanks. And it's hard. And I fall. I'm sure we all fall. But let us never see ourselves as inherently the same as our mistakes, one. Number two, let us realize the absolute value, the holiness, the purity of those desires to simply want to change in the first place. Because they can indeed, in themselves, make us better people. Because a light will shine down on us, making us into better people. Questions, comments. Yeah, think about this for, I'm not being facetious. Think about this for 10 years. I'm recording this class. You want to hear it over again. Listen to it in the car. You know, put it on when you're doing the dishes, when you're on an errand, driving somewhere, whatever it is. If you want this sheet, I will email it to you. Just the Rob Cook poem alone can go on the fridge. You know what you can do? Print it off, put it inside your machso for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. That's an idea as well. 
If you're really a masochist, hide it with your Hanukkah candles and see where you're up to at the beginning of December. <laughs> and then remind yourself of the message. It's okay. It's okay. I might not be where I was on Rosh Hashanah, but it's okay. I still want to be a better person. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dear friends, thank you so much. Thank you for learning with me. I, 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 it's what a privilege, what an honor, and uh, what a blessing. We will be together for the third of our three-part series next Wednesday, 1 p.m. Montreal time. And um, we're going to look at forgiving but not forgetting. Oh, just a small little, a small little topic. <laughs> you have two minutes for questions, you... Rabbi? Or... Yeah, absolutely. If anyone has okay. to dash off, I'm respectful of that too. But yeah, I've got time for questions, of course. I have to dash off, but would you please, I think in the comments, a bunch of people would love the handout from last week too. Pleasure. Pleasure. I'll send it to you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Um, I, I, well, anyways, I, I, uh, I'm sure everybody, uh, but I, I really appreciated the, the, the talk today, Rabbi, and very uh, inspiring. And I have a question about the, um, you know, we, we, you mentioned how we um, uh, bring ourselves. I, I guess when we we try to evaluate our our our, la our our lacking performance and trying to do teshuva and what have you, we'll we'll you know negatively evaluate ourselves. And I wonder what's the you know in the in the beginning text that we talked you talked about how um, we return to God and that is the ultimate and and. It, is it possible? Well, I mean, the, the sub question is, I imagine, you know, our thinking is we have to be perfect, right? Um, but if it's in the Torah, then are we expected to be perfect? Or when are we expected to be perfect? How is that supposed to actually be relevant to us that, you know, final El uh, Hashem to Hashem, Teshuvah to Hashem? <clears throat> yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you. That's a really great question. Thank you. Oh, um, I don't know if it's possible. I was waiting for if you were going to answer the question. I okay. was thinking. I was thinking. I don't know if it's possible this side of heaven to get to perfection. I really don't think it's possible. And, you know, I started with an interpretation of Nachmanides, the Ramban, I'm going to return back to him, if you excuse the pun, return back to him. But I'm going to return back to Nachmanides, where he says that the ultimate repentance will actually be in the end of days where humanity will lose their freedom of choice and we will become perfect only because God will take away the Yetzirah, the evil inclination from us. This is a radical theology. And the Ramban, working off of a passage, in that opening passage in Devarim 30, that, that says, I will circumcise your hearts. And he's like, hmm, circumcise your hearts? Well, what would that look like? Let's, let's take God seriously. And think through, circumcise your hearts. And he says, I'll remove a part of your heart. Just like a, remo a circumcision is a removal of a part of the body. I will remove a part of your heart. Which part, says the Ramban? The part of your heart that desires evil. And that's what it means to have a circumcision of wow. the heart. And, and he has this radical approach where he says, in the future... In the ultimate end of days, human beings won't have freedom anymore because they will just have an innate desire for the good. But what comes along with that will be a loss of their humanity. So, so to kind of go into this fascinating idea of the Ramban, you might be right, David. You might be right. It, it's not possible this side of our humanity. And all that we can try for is the aspirational sense of working towards the goal. 
Okay. Okay, friends, thank we're going to thank pause you for your here. Answer. Thank you very much. Um, this was beautiful. This was really special. And thank you so much for joining me. It's an honor and a privilege. And I look forward to next week when we will continue learning. Thank, thank you, Rafi. Have a good week. Thank you. Be well, everybody. Thank you.